Hello and welcome to our video summarizing everything you need to know about the poem Nothing's Changed by Tatamkulu Africa. My name is Barbara and in this video I'll go over the poem beginning with some context about the poet himself before going into detail on what each of the stanzas mean. So let's get started. Now, Ismail Tutankulu Africa Jubert was born in Egypt as Mohammed Faud Nassif to an Arab father and a Turkish mother on the 7th December 1920. His parents relocated to South Africa in 1923 where they died from Asian flu, leaving him orphaned at the age of two. He was then taken care of by friends and family before being given over to a Methodist couple who renamed him John Carlton. In 1964, he embraced Islam and changed his name to Ismail Jubert before settling in District 6 in South Africa. When District 6 was destroyed in 1967, he launched a militant Muslim organisation known as Al-Jihad. Al-Jihad was not only opposed to but fought against apartheid. It was also a welfare organisation. Ismail Jubert and other members of Al Jihad joined Um Konto Wasizway, so MK, the armed wing of the African National Congress, the ANC, in the early 1980s. As a result of his political activities, he was arrested and charged with terrorism in 1987 and he spent some time in prison and he was then banned for five years and forbidden to write. Now, on a separate note, if you'd be interested to know a little bit about South African history and also a bit about apartheid, do check out our other video on South Africa, which goes into detail on this. However, going back to context, now, during his time in MK, he was given the name Tatamkulu Africa, which means Grandfather of Africa, a name that he officially adopted as his own. Tutankulu Africa then used his new name to write whilst he was in contravention of his banning orders. In other words, he disobeyed the ban to write and he carried on writing. Now, moving on to the poem, Nothing's Changed. This poem talks about the rampant apartheid system in District 6 near Cape Town in South Africa and explores the racism. The ironic title brings to light how ap after apartheid, nothing's changed but the physical appearance of District 6. Nothing's change expresses the speaker's anger towards the racists, especially the whites, and it reveals the experience of turning back to South Africa after the system of racial separ separation called apartheid has been overturned. Now, when you read through the first stanza of Nothing's Change, it shows the irritation and anger of the speaker when he says that the irritating stones that click under the feet of uh, the poet themselves create a hard, irritating sound, which is an example of onomatopoeia. The speaker then says there's an untidiness all around, and this is increased more by the spreading weeds all around. And in this stanza, the poet is shown as walking across the wasteland that he knew since his childhood and the destroyed six, District 6, which fills the poet full of anger and irritation. Words like stones, seeding grasses, cans, weeds are images that the poet uses to make this poem really lively and realistic. The poem does to some extent have a friendly and amiable tone initially and the opening has a series of monosyllabic words. However, it can be quite percussive and this helps in building up an imagery in the opening lines in which the poet really sets up the appearance of the wasteland which is District 6. With the use of the first person, the poet also takes us into his own world. In the last line of the first stanza, the narrator uses another poetic device such as amiable weeds, whilst the use of words like clicks and crunch are the examples of onomatopoeia that I've referred to. Now, in the second stanza, the speaker brings about a change in the poem's tone using the two-word title, District 6. This stark statement at the very start of the stanza familiarises the readers about what the poet is going to talk about and this stanza also recognises the place as District 6, which is recognisable not only by a signboard, by an instinct, to quote from the poem, my feet know and my hands. In fact, every part of the poet's body seems to recognise District 6. The repetition of the word and in Lines 12, 13, 14 and 15 shows the speaker's growing anger. Also, the frequent use of punctuation establishes this sense of anger. 
Note that this tone of anger that the speaker expresses through imagery of body parts is against the establishment of the restaurant that has been constructed among the debris of District 6. The construction of this restaurant, which destroys District 6, also shows the supremacy of the whites over the blacks. And this stanza ends with a sense of anger at, and to quote from the poem, the hot white inwards turning anger of my eyes, which depicts that the speaker is full of anger due to the, his rooted hatred of whites and also his hatred stemming from how the whites have oppressed the blacks in South Africa. Now, in the third stanza, the speaker takes his reader to a brash restaurant which is full of upmarket haute cuisine with a guard at the gatepost. This restaurant can be easily recognised as a place for whites only, which means no black is allowed to get in there. This very scene of the restaurants and the warnings written here angers the speaker. He calls it brash, which is a personification of something almost lurking or hiding in the grass or weeds and it squats. The height of this speaker's rage is increased more when they find a guard at the gatepost of the restaurant, which means that people sitting inside the restaurant feel like they need protection by using this guard. And this really irritates the speaker who wants to break the restaurant brash with glass. In the fourth stanza, which is quite brief, it speaks a thousand words through just these two lines. It sheds light over the racism that's still inherent in South Africa. And when the narrator sees the construction of the restaurant over the debris of District 6, he says that there's no sign, yet we still know where our place is in society and where we belong. The apartheid signs might have gone now that South Africa is a democracy, but the speaker knows that a man of mixed or uh, of darker skinned race would not be welcome in this upmarket restaurant. In other words, he knows where he belongs, not in the upmarket restaurant, but in the working caf men's cafe, which is just down the road. In the fifth stanza, the writer looks through the window and the key feature of the stanza is colour imagery, mostly the white colour imagery. All that is white, the crushed ice, the linen, the rose, the restaurant. The poet uses all of this imagery to put emphasis on just the whiteness of the restaurant against a black backdrop. And it stands out and reinforces the notion that black people are just not welcome here. They're part of the background, they're to be ignored, not to be embraced. Yet, the single rose on the table is not white, which symbolises the red blood of all human beings. The metaphor of a flower decorating a table also symbolises the blood that's been shed during South Africa's struggle for freedom and, of course, its struggle against apartheid. In the sixth stanza, the speaker describes a contrast between the working men's cafe down the road and the restaurant on the other side. He says that in the working men's cafe, the blacks themselves have to carry the food with them. The cafe has plastic tables, there are no serviettes as people wipe their fingers on their jeans, they spit a little on the floor and it's in the bone. In all, the pleasant and uncivilised scenario of the man's cafe is a total and complete contrast to the restaurant which is quite posh and fully embedded with all sorts of amenities. Now, in the final seventh stanza, the speaker moves away from the scene, reverts back to being a boy again, and there's a sense of smallness about him. It's as if the whole experience has left him feeling really inadequate. He wants to throw a stone or a bomb at the glass, which represents his anger at the whole scene. And this is the rage that still exists in the mind of the poet and very likely in the mind of many black South Africans.